come here to talk about um, metaphor, language, and reality. Not too ambitious. Uh, and the re I come by my interest in, in language very naturally, almost biologically. My mother, at a time when women were not editors, was an editor at Fortune magazine. And she was a stickler for uh, proper usage and um, correct pronunciation. And back when I was nine or 10 years old, this is one of the first memories that I have of this particular obsession of hers. I pointed to an ad in the New York Times and said, boy, you know, that's an amazing ring from Tiffany's. And she said, I will disown you if you ever say Tiffany's again. The name of the company is Tiffany. Look, Tiffany and company. So that was a sort of early warning. Later, on a more risque moment, um, I was in high school at this point. We'd moved from Greenwich Village, Greenwich Village to Nyack, New York, where I went to high school. And she came home from Fortune Magazine, where she worked. And she said in a parlance that was acceptable at the time, you know, Danny, I just heard one Negro boy say to another, get the fuck up on the bicycle. And she said, and I was shocked, because I'd never heard her use this kind of language before. She said, what I'm wondering is what part of speech the fuck is in that sentence. So um, that'll give you an idea of the kind of attention that she paid to grammar and structure. Um, I want to talk about dead metaphors first. Dead metaphors, as many of you probably know, are figures of speech that are no longer consciously in our minds. Uh, probably the phrase dead metaphor itself is a dead metaphor because you don't really, it, like dead issue. You don't really think of corpses or morgues or necrosis or anything like that. It's just uh, an abstract use of a term from one place to another. Um, some other examples, uh, flower bed. We don't really think of a bed particularly. Um, you sort of take it on a literal level, even though it's not literal. On the spot, well, OK, uh, I guess I am. Uh, out cold, uh, last leg, you don't really think of the anatomy. Um, the jitters, uh, well, again, in my case, maybe fairly literal. But usually, you don't think of someone actually shaking. Um, these are pieces of language that are fossilized uh, in the language we use every day. Uh, but, they're, but, but they're part of what we say. They're part of the weight and freight that our language carries uh, out into the world, whether we're aware of them or not. There are supposedly five stages in the grieving process uh, for oncoming human mortality. I don't remember what they are. I don't really care to think about them. But I do want to say that I think there are three stages in the death of a metaphor, uh, or the life and death of a metaphor. And the first one is life. The first one is when somebody coins a phrase in a new way that says something fresh and original. You can imagine in whatever language it was, it doesn't matter, uh, maybe a thousand years ago, a boy said to a girl, you are so sweet, a metaphor itself. Then he said, you're my heart. I said, no, that's not good enough. You're my sweetheart. At which point, if the girl liked the boy, she was very flattered, and there was a kind of moment of recognition of a fresh use of language. Um, and uh, another example might be, again, from some earlier time, some language we don't know anymore. Somebody, man or woman, noticed that at a certain time of the year, the days get shorter, and they get darker, and they get chillier and may have seen the sun setting a little bit sooner than uh, the day before or the week before, and they said, oh, it's the fall. And when you say the fall, of course, there's another word, autumn, but we say the fall, we don't think of a literal physical decline, but obviously that's where the word came from. And from my own sort of area of alleged expertise, journalism and literature, when the first newspapers were published, and they, I don't know if you've seen the old-fashioned New York Times or other such journals, 
They had columns of type, bodies of type, metaphorically. And at the top of them, there were these larger letters that told you what the story was about. Well, imagine how pleased it, whoever it was was when he said, oh, that's the headline. Again, a, a, a dead metaphor, uh, one that you don't stop to think about consciously when you use the word headline. The second stage of, in the death of a metaphor, and by the way, this is not a bad death. It's a good death, as you'll see. Is, but this one's not so great. This is the indifference that familiarity breeds. Um, this is where what used to be fresh, um, like at the end of the day, instead of in conclusion, uh, phrases like that become cliches, and they become language modules that we conveniently fit into our, to our conversations uh, because they're sort of viral, and they, they're sort of, what used to be silver dollars are now kind of worn out copper pennies. And um, in fact, uh, just to go back again to a couple of other examples of somewhat dead metaphors, um, you, when you say he's on the stepping, that's a stepping stone to success. You, chances are you don't think of an actual stone. If you say that guy up there on the stage, he's grandstanding. Well, you know, that comes from, I think, horse racing and um, large events, but you mean showing off. The actual physical image that goes into that word is not really present in your mind. As I said, um, the cliches uh, that uh, plague us at this second stage are overwhelmingly numerous. This is the cliche site online. And as writer, young writers or even middle-aged or even geezer writers, you might do well to consult um, this uh, site because it kind of shows you what obstacles to avoid, what not to fall back on all hands on deck, uh, all bets are off, bent out of shape. This is just the A's. It goes on and on, and it's scary. Um, but then lower than the level of cliches, out of danger, in a way, of being just convenient, uh, are everyday commonplace words that have metaphorical content. The Grim Reaper comes along, sort of slays the fresh, usage, the cliched usage, and sort of makes the figure of speech basically deceased within the word. Um, so that's, that's what a dead metaphor is. But there's a, there's a fourth stage. I lied. The fourth stage is the buried metaphor. That is to say, the word, for instance, metaphor itself is a metaphor. Why? Because it's derived from the Greek. Meta, I'm sure you all know that, over. Ferine, to transfer or to, um, to send over. And so a metaphor is a carrying over from one sense of a word to another apt application. And that's the way our language is basically made. with one exception, and that exception is rudimentary primal words like foot, nose, cloud. There are certain words that sort of, even when you trace them back etymologically, meant, always meant what they mean, whether in Anglo-Saxon or Latin or, they've, or very close to it. Now, I've just said, haven't I, that they are not metaphorical. Later on, I'm going to take that back in a more grandiose and probably somewhat deranged way and say that they are metaphorical. But right now, let's say that they're not. They're the bricks out of which our language is built. And from that point on, the bricks become complicated architecture and buildings. Um, our language is, our living language walks on a, on a graveyard of buried, um, dead and buried metaphors. And it draws its strength and spirit from them and it's, it, it's important to know, I think, what those spirits are, what those ghosts are. All this brings up for me two big questions. All this talk about buried dead metaphors and, 
and the quality of, of um, implication that, what, how aware are you of the metaphorical figurative content of what you say? That's the first big question. Is it part of what you say, whether you know it or not? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said that language is fossil poetry. And if he's right, it means that when we speak in ordinary terms, the fact is that we are speaking greater volumes than we realize. Um, take the word cancer for an example. Um, the word cancer uh, means crab in Latin, as, most, as many of you probably know. And um, uh, if you're an astrologer, I mean, you kind of know that cancer means crab because it's one of the signs of the zodiac. But in fact, if you're not, even if you are an astrologer, if you have the misfortune to have to talk about the illness, you may say the word cancer without any conscious knowledge that it contains this root. But it's perfect, for, especially for certain forms of the illness. First of all, according to some human standards, it's ugly. Secondly, the kind of branching and reaching out that you can see that it does is very um, fitting for the form that this illness takes. Um, anyway, there's a large body of thought that says that using a word like cancer doesn't convey, unless you are saying cancer, which means crab, doesn't convey its root meaning. Uh, I think it does. I think, it's, I think whether you know it or not, it's almost a species-like quality that our words are loaded and filled with these ancient origins. Um, let me give two examples. Uh, John Milton in Paradise Lost talks about the eviction of Satan from heaven. And he describes him um, in... Uh, in hell, finding cast down fallen angels as abject. He, that's, a, that's Milton's word. And so uh, we know what abject means. It means devastated, sad, depressed. But it's from a Latin combination of words, ab yacio, throw from. So it, when, when Milton knew Latin, he was a great Latin scholar, so he chose that word on purpose. And it's literally true. The Satan and his angels have been, and his henchmen, have been thrown down from heaven. So when we read that he's abject, if you've had Latin, and if there's any inspirational part of this talk, it would be to, you know, what your grandfather said or grandmother, please study Latin. You know how fitting and appropriate that one single choice of the word is. Another example, a little lighter, uh, a little riskier, maybe. Uh, the word uh, avocado, um, you all know what it means. It sounds Spanish, and in fact, it is brought over from the Spanish, and it refers to the vegetable. Well, there's a, there, there are differences of opinion about the derivation of av avocado, but the one that I like the best, uh, when I think it's also the most respectable in its way, is that it's from the Aztec word, ahuacatl, which I couldn't even bother to try to spell for you. But you can hear the sort of similar sound, ahuacatl, avocado. Ahuacatl in Aztec means testicle. I can't help it. Um, and I will leave the rest to your um, enjoyment. But before we go on, I will tell you that testicle itself means little witness from the Latin. So I agree with Gregory Dawes, who says that um, to suggest words always carry with them something of what they may have, I disagree with him, have been, he says it's an etymological fallacy. And uh, to quickly go to the next gentleman, a Hungarian who loves English named Zoltan Kovexis, um, he says the dead metaphor account misses an important point, namely that what is deeply entrenched, hardly noticed, and thus effortlessly, effortlessly used is active in our thought. This is where I stand. Folks, you hear politicians say, some folks want to shut down the government. Well, that's a very friendly word, but 
let's say he doesn't agree. He's using it sarcastically. He may mean to be friendly, but in fact, it's a sarcastic word with an edge in it. So we need to be aware of what our language is saying. And I guess the more you study, the more direct you can be, the more precise you can be, the less you'll be misunderstood. Disagreements are about ideas are one thing. Misunderstandings are often brought about by a misuse or a wrong use of language. Second big question, what are we talking about? That's a very big question. We're talking about an effort of the human mind to convey reality. And in my opinion, now I'm going to take back what I said about cloud and snow and foot. Every single word that we utter is a kind of a metaphor. We take from the outside external word, world, we bring it inside, we put it into language, and um, in a way, it's also a carrying over. That is to say, it's a metaphor. We have a kind of existential arrogance. We can't hear what a dog can hear. We can't see what a hawk can see. We can't feel what a spider can feel. Our reality is an anthropocentric one. And so the idea that language can convey everything, even though it's an amazement and, and really a complex thing, um, as you can see, even in mathematical thought, uh, we have these amazing abilities to convey ideas about numbers and space and, and language. It's a kind of noble um, but tragic misunderstanding because beyond the confines of our senses, beyond the confines of our language, there's probably something else. And I think that two things give us glimmers of that something else. One is science where we get, we know electrons are passing through us now. We see the Higgs boson, uh, things that we never thought we'd be able to see. And the other is poetry. Poetry distorts, compresses, expands um, language to the point where we may get a glimmer of something else, something we hadn't really thought about. And we get chills, just the way we do from great science. So we knock against the walls of our senses and our words. I don't think we'll ever get through, but still that language is an amazement and it would behoove all of us to know more about it. We're at the end about the other reality. We're left with, with a mystery. We don't know what's beyond what we can understand or see. And the word mystery is perfect because it comes over from the Latin, carried over, mysterium, a secret thing. Thank you very much.